That lady in the white yes. dress is presenting to the mayor. Let the record reflect. We have reconvened with all members present. Uh, Councilman Carmela Vitali is absolutely excused. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing after the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing. I want to recognize four Madison residents who left their impact on our community who died over the last two weeks. First, uh, Pat Dow. Led, uh, who died at the age of 93 on September 10th. She was uh, born in Orange, New Jersey and truly was a child of the Depression and World War II. Pat was one of the original Rosie the Riveters, working in a defense plants to aid the war effort during the summers of uh, 1943 and 45. In 1949, she met her future husband, George Dow, while they were volunteering the Orange Memorial Hospital, married in 1950, and moved to a small house in Madison where they would live for their next 60 years. And as was stated in her obituary, of all her decisions in her life, none was prouder than her choice of, of Madison as her family, for her family. Pat took, in 1963, Pat took a job in, in, at Drew University, a place she came truly to love, where she would spend the rest of her paid working career until she retired in 89. She moved into her second career at that point, a volunteer in Madison, served five years in the Madison Library Board of Trustees, but uh, really spending most of the time in the Madison Seniors. She served as the RSVP Outreach Coordinator, President of the Madison Senior Center Trustees and its Senior Citizens Advisory Committee during the time. And this was also when the Senior Center was established on Walnut Street. She also frequently volunteered teaching uh, English as a second language for the high school. And she really missed a borough meeting, never shy about sharing her thoughts on how to make Madison better as uh, Austria and Carmela and I know from um, campaigns of many years ago that no uh, route to uh, being elected in Madison didn't go through with sitting down with Pat Dow in her kitchen. She left Madison in 2010 to live near her eldest son Norman and is now survived by Norman and Scott, seven grandchildren, four great-grandchildren. A memorial service will be held at Burroughs and Core on October 5th from 12 to 3 with, with visitation from 12 to 2 and service from 2 to 3. In lieu of flowers, donations can be made to the Madison Senior Center or Alzheimer's Association. We also lost Victoria Du, longtime Madison resident. Died at her home on September 6th after a long illness. She was born in 1950 in Cali, Columbia. Moved to Brooklyn with her parents at, her, at the age of 8 graduate of Brooklyn College. Victoria loved the outdoors, enjoyed camping, hiking, biking, skiing, teaching and scuba diving. She was served as advisor for Sea Scouts in Staten Island and committee head of Boy Scout Troop 25 in Madison. She was a devoted mother and avidly assisted her, uh, her son's participation in sports programs, the Scouts and Long Hill Chapel youth group. She was an assistant teacher at Madison High School, taught Spanish and special needs students, and also assisted with the Madison before and after school program. She is survived by her husband of 36 years, John Du, and three sons. And a memorial visitation for Victoria will be held this Friday from 5 to 9 at Madison Memorial Home also, and with a uh, service at Long Hill Chapel 1030 on Saturday. And uh, in lieu of flowers, contributions may be named, Victoria's, made to Victoria's name, Youth with a Mission. And uh, information is on the um, Madison Memorial Home uh, website or the Madison Volunteer Ambulance Corps. We also lost Tony Scotty, a lifelong Madison, died at home on September 14th. She was 59. Tony was born in 1959 with third generation Madisonian. After graduating Madison High School, she had a long career as a power legal uh, secretary, working for Joe Mazaka, who was a longtime borough attorney. Tony was predeceased by her father, Anthony Tony Donato, 
and she is survived by her beloved husband, 34 years, Gary Scotty, her loving daughter, Kelly, of, in Florida, and her mother, Stephanie, and her four devoted sisters. Tony loved her family and friends tremendously, and she certainly would do anything for them. She, she had a big heart and warm nature, and will always be remembered. And in lieu of flowers, the family is asked uh, to make donations to the Alzheimer's Association also. And we also lost Teresa Rowland, born in 1953 to the late Cliff and Jeanette Rowland, raised in Chatham Township. She was a member of the Chatham High School class of 71 and uh, went to Penn State. She became aware and enlightened by the benefits of yoga in the late 1970s. She was drawn to yoga so much that she began to study ancient practice and entered into a lifelong vocation as a professional yoga instructor. She established her first studio in her garage in Chatham in 1978, but she is known in Madison for establishing Studio Yoga and the Studio Yoga Teaching and Education Program. Throughout her career, she focused on constant learning and improvement, proudly taught for over 45 years. She focused on general positivity, positivity and life, living life as best as possible. Teresa's zest for life and appreciation in her life for, uh, has helped survive cancer for many years and lost her, lost her battle just recently. She, she opened the uh, yoga studio in Madison in 1989, which is long before we see now wellness and fitness becoming a mainstay on Main Street. So well ahead of her time and the yoga studio is still going strong. We celebrated the 30th anniversary with a ribbon cutting back this spring. And uh, information on the uh, memorial service, I believe, is, uh, yeah, is also through Madison Memorial um, Home. So let's take a moment to recognize those four people who left a tremendous mark on our community and to our residents. Thank you. on this lovely summer night. We have uh, some catching up with the uh, minutes that uh, we had not approved recently or previously. <laughs> May I have a motion for the regular minutes of February 11th, 2019. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 And a motion for the regular minutes of April 8th, 2019. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 And welcome all. A couple of comments, and I'm going to come down and do a couple presentations. Uh, this past Thursday, we had the third annual Peace March, uh, which is inspired by Dr. Martin Luther King's concept of beloved community, as it has in the uh, previous uh, marches. It starts in Morris Township at the College of St. Elizabeth with their students. They go down the traction line to uh, Florham Park and Fairleigh Dickinson, right at Danforth, where the FDU students uh, join in and uh, welcome the St. E students, and then they march on to Drew University, where more students uh, join in. So a great concept of a uh, marching for peace and something that grows at every stop. And we had about over 100 students uh, on the plaza out here in front to hear the message of peace. And uh, then I was at the Madison train station the next morning, the Friday, to uh, send off the Drew students as they got on the 1035 train, I believe it was, as they held head into New York City for the strike for action to address climate change. I thank them for taking the, the time to do that. Uh, yesterday, many of us uh, gathered at the at Temple of Sinai to celebrate the life of Ben Wolkowitz. And I want to thank Ostry, who did an amazing job to uh, share Ben's in, impact on the community. And uh, we heard all sorts of great stories of what a great man Ben was, and we truly will miss him. I um, then shifted over to the Coltis House, where I presented Bob and Kathy Coltis with a proclamation to recognize their 60th wedding anniversary. Uh, most people know Bob and Kathy very well because um, 
They're lifelong uh, residents of Madison and have not only been committed to each other for 60 years, they've also been dedicated to our community for that whole time. Anytime Bob Coltis is in a uh, room and you hear his laugh, you know he is there, no matter how many people uh. are in attendance. That was a great uh, time, to, great thing to be at. I'm going to come on down for a couple of presentations. John Hoover, you want to come up and join me here? <laughs> oh, okay. <Sorry. laughs> All right. So, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll throw a block for you. <laughs> Christine Newman and Bridget Quinn and um, Lavelle Jones, please come forward also. As, uh, as everyone knows, or if you don't, I'll say it again, we've been recognized as the best place to live in uh, New Jersey out of 565 communities. So, uh, and part of that is the fact that we are a walkable community and we're an age-friendly community. And so we're so proud to join the AARP network of age-friendly communities. Our enrollment and participation in this network will uh, signify our dedication of, as I just said, being the best livable town in New Jersey. We look forward to be part of the AARP network and the opportunity to learn and share best practices in building an age-friendly community. And through our collaborative efforts with Tri-Town 55 Plus, with John's leadership, we, uh, we have been on the forefront and want to remain on the forefront of building a lifelong community through collaborations with all the municipal leaders, community organizations, and residents. So it's a great honor to have Lavelle here, and uh, Christine is sitting over there, right? And Bridget is right. Here. Christine's, not here. Christine's not here. Okay, so she. Yep. And so Lavelle is the AARP New Jersey State President, serves as principal volunteer and spokesperson for 1.3 million members and 300 volunteers. And in partnership with the state director, state president helps position AARP New Jersey to achieve organizations of mission, which is to empower people to live the lives they choose as they age. Graduate of Wellesley College and Seton Hall Law School. Yay. Thank you for coming and I will Okay, well, thank you, Mayor Conley, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, as the AARP New Jersey State President, um, it gives me the pleasure to be here tonight to welcome Madison into the AARP Network of Age-Friendly Communities. Uh, Mayor Conley, we are excited to be part of your continued efforts to develop more age-friendly, livable communities and neighborhoods. And to the entire Madison Town Council, thank you all for your support. I also want to thank the Tri, is it Tri Town? 55 plus coalition and Councilman John Hoover for initiating and launching the age-friendly initiative. I also want to thank Laura Sostak for her direction and also her coordination. And we always at AARP New Jersey recognize and thank all of the community members and the volunteers who devote their time and talent because we know that they are so invaluable. I know you have a tight schedule tonight, so I'm only going to talk for a couple of minutes, but I did want to just share a little bit of the background on AARP's network. Uh, we at AARP have been working on livable environments for 60 years. Then in 2012, we created a network for communities across the country who <laughs> wanted to create neighborhoods where people could live and enjoy 
for all ages. And the reason we did that is very simple. In the United States, as it is in the rest of the world, there is a profound <coughs> age shift that's taking place. Today in the United States, there are about 46 million people who are over the age of 65. By the year 2030, there are going to be 76 million people over the age of 65. And by the year 2035, there will be more people <laughs> over the age of 65 than there are children. And think about this statistic. An American child today who's 10 years old has a 50% chance of living to the age of 104. And so it's good policy to create communities where people can grow up and where people can grow old. And age really doesn't define what a community needs because we recognize that when a community addresses the needs of its oldest and its youngest residents, it does address the needs of everyone in between. So AARP's network is free. It's open to communities of all sizes, towns, cities, boroughs, villages, counties. We're very proud that in 2017, New York became the first state to join our network. And we are absolutely thrilled and delighted that I am here today to congratulate Madison. Madison is the 393rd member of AARP's network. So congratulations to everyone who had a part in that. And so, Mayor, we applaud your vision and your leadership. We look forward to working with you. And on behalf of our state director, Stephanie Hunzinger, Christine Newman, as well as our special program, uh, programmer, uh, Bridget, we want to congratulate you all and thank you so much for being a part of this network. Thank you so much. So, on behalf of AARP New Jersey, it's my pleasure to present Mayor Connolly with the AARP Network of Age-Friendly Communities Enrollment Certificate. Congratulations. Representatives from the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts, please come forward. Hi, Tom. How are you, Meg? Very special proclamation. It's um, for those of us who have been in this town a long time, it's hard to believe it's already 50 years, but uh, to have the museum a part of Madison, another thing that has truly makes us such a great place and pushes us up right into that number one rating. But not only that, what you do for one of the most special buildings in, in this town. So a proclamation recognition of the 50th anniversary of the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts. Whereas housed in the James Library, which was built in 1899, the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts is listed in both state and national registries of historic buildings and is an anchor for the historic downtown Madison as a key participant in cultural life for the community. And whereas founded in 1969 by Edgar and Agnes Land, who provided their entire collection of 6,000 artifacts for the purpose of exploring the lives and technology of the first generations of New Jersey settlers, craftspeople, and farmers and artisans, and whereas the original museum exhibits were designed and constructed by Edgar Land, were also developed and taught programs for children to ensure the historical significance of the early immigrants, and today the museum is recognized nationally for its innovative programs that has 10,000 visitors annually, 7,000 which are students from across the state. And whereas in 1981 an endowment of 100,000 was raised by Edgar Land through donations and membership, and in 1995 under the guidance of Agnes Land, the museum 
began a capital campaign to complete renovations, reopening on Bottle Hill Day 1997, revealing the stunning interior and the windows and new exhibit space. And whereas in recent years, the museum created a new and more modern logo and branding and adopted a new strategic plan ensuring future success with a new mission to inspire a connection with New Jersey's history, cultural, trades, and crafts with a new vision of sharing the past and inspiring the future. And whereas in addition to being New Jersey's premier history museum, the museum became Madison's Visitor Center in 2017. And whereas serving as a steward for the historic James Library building by working with Morris County Historic Preservation Trust in the Borough of Madison, the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts has ensured the continued conservation and preservation of, like, of the iconic building. Now, therefore I, Robert H. Connolly, Mayor of Bur Borough Madison, on behalf of the governing body, hereby congratulate the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts on its 50th anniversary and extend best wishes for continued success and another 50 years and more. Thank you. Just very briefly, I just want to thank um, the borough for this. I want to thank uh, Mayor Conley. I want to thank our council liaison, uh, John Hoover, and all of the council. Um, we're very proud of the work that we've done at the museum. Um, it's been 50 years, and we hope that we um, have done our founder proud. Um, and we are really also very proud of the collaboration that we have with the town. Um, you know, the building is the historic and most iconic building in Madison, and we're very proud to be stewards of that building, and we couldn't do it without the support of the Borough Council and of the um, municipal government. So thank you so much, and uh, here's to 50 more years. <laughs> Who do we have up there? Oh, okay, so Angelica Diggs is um, Assistant Director, Operations, um, and we have um, our board chair, Tom Judd, and um, trustee, Ginny Wilson. Just, it's been my privilege for 20 years now to serve on this board. And during that time, I've seen the museum grow from essentially a private collection into the thoroughly professional museum we are now, with Deb Starker leading the way for a good many of those years. And I'm really looking forward to the future. We're a, a wonderful organization. We want to encourage everyone to come and visit us and see what we see our beautiful building, which it looks like it did on the day it opened now, and see the wonderful things we have inside. So thank you so much. Tom, um, thank you, and thank you. Congratulations. Any reports from committees, public safety, Council President Bailey. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Um, from the Fire Chief um, DeRosa, this morning around 2.15 a.m., um, the Madison Fire Department were dispatched to Chatham to assist them along with Florham Park, Chatham Township, Green Village, and Summit Fire Departments for a commercial structure fire at 143 Main Street. Uh, this is an example of uh, how we share our services, a detached garage, utility truck, and tandem 18-wheeler truck were on fire. Uh, then the adjacent property uh, and cars were, became, um, also were set on fire, but they were able to extinguish the fires, and uh, they're back in um, Madison by 5 a.m. And then um, I want to report that uh, Morris County recently launched their new emergency alert system, you should have received this in the mail. If you haven't, we have many more here at Borough Hall. Uh, the alert system is called Alert Morris, which provides notices for Morris County, as well as most of the 39 municipalities. Within the Borough of Madison, it will be referred to as Alert Madison. With Alert Madison, residents will continue to receive the same emergency alerts and mass notifications via email, text, or phone as they currently do. So that's important to note. Um, the Borough of Madison has a new emergency alert system known as Alert Madison. The Police Department, along with Morris County, is advising residents to register with Alert Madison to ensure that they are properly enrolled in the new system. And you can do this by going to www.alertmadison.org. And as of November 1st, that's your day, important date to remember, Alert Madison will be replacing Nixle for borough-wide notifications. 
And if you have any questions, you can email alertmadison at rosenet.org or call 973-408-8789. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Utilities, Mr. Rowe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. First in the electric department, the old Butler building has been painted and the broken windows have been replaced. And the new Butler building is now complete on the outside. We're in the process of installing outlets and hanging pipe for lights. I want to thank Russ Browner and Jim Burke for their assistance. Uh, next, the line clearance crew, Rich Tree Service, is currently in week nine of 12, a 12-week contract. You may see them on your street clearing limbs and branches that are growing near our electrical wires. It's to maintain the health and safety of our network. And finally, uh, the electric department's pleased to announce there have been no emergencies, no power outages, and no call outs since our last meeting. And now from the water department, uh, the hydrant flushing program, which started on Monday, September 16th, is approximately one quarter done. Uh, flushing will continue through the month of October. If you experience low pressure, discoloration of water, or air bubbles in the water, uh, this is just a temporary condition. Running or flushing your outside faucet or laundry sink should alleviate that problem. Finally, the department will also be installing a new water service and hose connections at the Elks Club parking lot for the purpose of car wash fundraising for various organizations. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Public Works and Engineering, Ms. Burton. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, from the Department of Public Works, um, GPW has been servicing and repairing police vehicles and fire vehicles. They're also getting ready for the fall cleanup. The chainsaws have been repaired. The leaf vacuum machines are under service. Um, <clears throat> and the lawn cutting equipment has also been taken care of. The Parks Department has been cutting, trimming, and weeding. Uh, they continue to uh, water all the baskets downtown and collecting, recycling, yard waste misses. The Roads Department, um, they've been trimming trees and removing tree steps. They've cleaned up the DPW yard. Um, they have facilitated the farmer's market and the police department uh, food truck by delivering cones and barricades. Um, <clears throat> white goods picks up, pickups. Um, and then finally, in terms of uh, the sewer department, the lift stations operations, they've had residential sewage calls and uh, miscellaneous marks, markouts. From engineering, uh, we have the water main replacement on a community place should go in this week. We will be resurfacing Wisteria, Linwood, part of Crestview, Lawrence, Laurel, Nordling, and Del Barton. They should be happy. Um, complete streets meeting met on September 18th, and the Street Smarts program endorsed by TransOption is in the process of being implemented here in Madison. Um, <clears throat> sewer lining on Beach, Rose, Cedar, and Pines is also scheduled, as well as an emergency appropriation for storm sewer work on Loveland, which we will be introducing tonight. Um, and finally, the Madison Environmental Commission has been very, very, very busy. Um, they had a really nice Echo House tour on Saturday that was attended by about like 175 people, which is a remarkable turnout. Um, people came away with ideas that they could bring home to their own homes and start saving some energy and um, and giving back in terms of. Uh, the environment. So um, that was great. And then tonight, uh, they are here to um, speak on behalf of a plas single use plastic bag ordinance, which we hope will um, be the start of many um, initiatives in Madison to make us um, a green community. So thank you very much. That's it, Mayor. Thank you. Community Affairs, Mr. Hoover. Well, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm going to start, I'm going to switch it up a little bit tonight rather than start with seniors. I want to talk about the Madison Community Arts Center. Saturday night, we experienced a phenomenal, phenomenal show called Madison Swings, which was a fundraiser for the Madison Community Arts Center. The, the artists that uh, Eric Hafen uh, was able to bring in were just tremendous, a whole variety of people. And if we, we ever do it again, you should all come. I feel bad for the people who weren't there because it was, a, it was just a phenomenal thing. It really was. It, uh, it was very successful financially and artistically. The gross was about $8,000. Some money is still to come in, and that should yield a net of about $6,500. Overall attendance was 145 people. 100 attended the reception afterwards at the Madison Community Arts Center. The mayor and Jerry Veza, president of MACA, 
thank the crowd and did a very nice job doing that. We had Carol and Dorfman dance, provided a couple of surprise principal dancers for the event. We were all blown away when we saw the dancers get up there. I mean, the music was, was great, but when the dancers got on the stage, it just blew everybody's socks off. It was just terrific. Um, uh, she also announced that her company will be having a special concert on Sunday, November 17th at the Madison Community Arts Center, and I urge you all to go. It was, it was just great. Uh, Dennis McNally was also there, and he's the current artist in exhibition at the center, and he was there as well. I urge you to go over to the Community Arts Center, take a look at his art. It's just phenomenal. Uh, additional renters uh, include the, the Arts PR Unlimited for the reading of Ibsen's The Master Builder. League of Women Voters will be there. Tailgate even event uh, sponsored by the Madison Education Foundation will happen as well. The M Madison High School Class Council Bingo will be held at the center on October 10th. Newark's Art PR Unlimited will, will hold a stage reading of Henry Ibsen's The Master Builder on Thursday evening, October 17th. And uh, there are several others. I'm not going to go into details on them, but there are, there are a lot of things going on. Eric's doing, Eric Hafen is doing just a phenomenal job in scheduling everything. For the seniors, just switch the page here. Get a little stuck with the water spill. Uh, Senior Citizen Advisory Committee met with the telephone reassurance at Norwest Cap. They call shut ins and people living alone that is funded by the county. We have callers at our senior center each day, but their program needs improvement. So a full report will be prepared by October 10th and discussed at the next meeting of SCAC, which will be held at the Rexford Tucker Apartments. <clears throat> we have enlisted three master gardeners to help with the garden plan for the senior center and Rexford Tucker, and we have site diagrams and beginnings for plans for next year's gardens. As part of our efforts to engage seniors, we have found an initial group of seniors to work the gardens under the guidance of the master gardeners. We have several people from Madison, as a matter of fact, who will be donating plants for the gardens, from their own gardens. Transportation. A SCAC member suggested we look into the status of transportation for seniors. The Tritown 55 Plus Coalition are planning to have a transportation update for the Senior Citizens Advisory Committee meeting, at which we will share current programs, current programs that exist and discuss the needs of seniors. This is becoming more and more of a, a growing problem for all seniors. Senior Center Picnic, a reminder, will be held on September 25th at noon. Please come. It's going to last about two hours. It should be, should be great. Um, Restaurant Week is for the down Director of Business Development and Downtown Development Commission. Restaurant Week is planned for Sunday, October 6th through Friday, October 11th in partnership with the Madison Area Chamber of Commerce. It will, uh, there will be a contest for diners. If you submit five receipts dated between October 6th and October 11th, by October 19th, you will be eligible to win a $100 Madison gift check. Bottle Hill Day is scheduled for October Saturday, October 5th. There is still time to participate. Sponsorship and application packets are available on rosenet.org. Please visit the Farmer's Market, Madison Farmer's Market, located on Central Avenue. It's going to be open until October, Thursdays, until October 24th. It's, become, it's really growing and getting a lot more people to attend. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce, the Council, and Mayor are invited to the networking event at the Park Avenue Club on September 25th. The club is hosting and offering an open bar, light fair, and a tour of the facility upon request. The Madison Car Show is scheduled for October 5th. The main sponsor is Madison Tire and Auto. Uh, Museum of Early Trades and Crafts, besides the tremendous recognition tonight, they will be hosting it at their annual benefit on September 27th at the Park Avenue Club at 184 Park Avenue. And for the uh, Recreation Advisory Committee, the recommendations for user fees is planned to be discussed at the next council meeting, hopefully. The mayor's fit wellness, the fitness crawl, occurred on September 15th. It was mildly attended, but declared a success. Sorry for so much, Mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you. And health. Ms. Cohen. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, flu clinic dates are as follows. Wednesday, October 16th at the Civic Center from 9 to 11 a.m. And Monday, October 21st from November, from, from 9 to 11. Madison residents may attend any scheduled clinics and all dates are on rosenet.org. Depending on vaccine supply, additional clinics will be scheduled. The vaccine that will be administered is regular dose, which is quadrivalent, 
violent <laughs> offering four strains of protection and not the high dose. If you have any questions, please call the health department at 973-593-3079. Thank you. Communications and petitions. Yes, Mayor. The Mayor and Council received a letter on September the 19th from residents of Norman Circle regarding groundwater runoff. And that has been referred to the um, our en engineer, Bob Vogel, and we'll be beginning the uh, surveying process to uh, so we're, we can have uh, Norman Circle uh, scheduled in the um, capital plan. And now we're on for the first of two invitations for discussions. And this is the one that is limited to items on our agenda and resolutions. So please listen carefully. Uh, because you can only comment on these items. If you want to comment other things, we will have a, um, another comment period a little bit later in the meeting. So the items that we have for um, on the uh, discussion agenda is the borough surplus policy, health services, electric vehicle charge, charging station, and police firearms training facility. The resolutions that are on our consent agenda, so you know whether you want to, if you want to comment on them, and you also understand what's in the consent agenda. 267 is resolution awarding contract to Matina and Sons of Hackensack uh, not to exceed $275,000 for a recycling center. This is funded through ordinances 34 and 46, 2019. Uh, resolution 268, uh, um, rejecting bids for yard waste collection disposal. There was only one bid uh, received and it was uh, flawed and so that has to be rebid. 269 is authorized in 35th annual draw the farms uh, run on Sunday, November 10th. 270, awarding contract to the purchase of two 48 inch Bobcat, Bobcat walk behind mowers for DPW not to exceed 11990 and this is funded through ordinance 28 2019 ordinance 271 approval of temporary signs for Madison high school band uh, tournament of the bands which will occur on September 29th the resolution 272 ratifying the appointment of Julia Sinatra for the position of intern and that is uh, for the farmers market at $12 an hour 273, ratifying the appointment of interns Maddie Meyer and Bailey Komu as uh, part-time unpaid interns for the farmer's market. Resolution 274, authorizing renewal of agreement for health services contract for Bloomfield Board of Education. We'll be hearing more on that shortly. Board of Education, Board of Health, sorry. Um, resolution 274, authorizing negotiation renewal agreement for the um, uh, health services Bloomfield Board of Health. And again, hearing from that shortly. I read, read that twice. Re did. Yeah, because we had to rewrite, and so I got to be on top of that. Uh, 275, authorizing shared service agreement with the uh, Board of Education to provide a special enforcement officer to, and that's at the junior school. Resolution 276 is a resolution authorizing the use of. Uh, up to 5,500 municipal open space trust funds for forestry mowing at the MRC, and this is um, through Ordinance 21 2019, and this is part of the conservation management plan for the MRC. Resolution 277 authorizing purchase of two police vehicles from Bayer Ford of um, Morristown, and this is not to exceed 85,494 and funded through the police trust and the vehicle account and the 2019 police operating budget. And 278 is accepting a grant from It Pays to Plug In, New Jersey Vehicle Charging Grants Program. Again, we'll hear a little bit on that shortly. And it's a $30,000 uh, grant for uh, electric vehicle charging stations. And 279, rejecting all bids for Hartley Dodge Memorial Plaza restoration and authorizing rebid. The, um, Two bids, uh, the lowest bid was far exceeded the uh, appropriation of the ordinance. And resolution 280, awarding a contract to National Water Main Cleaning Company in the amount of 62,000 for emergency sewer lining. And this is uh, funded through uh, ordinance 45, 2019. And resolution um, 281, approving a grant from the Jacob Henry Perkins Trust Fund 
uh, to a family to assist with a uh, installation of a ramp. Resolution 282, authorizing purchase and installation of new garage doors and related work for DPW. This is to Jersey Door Works, the amount of 33810 funded through Ordinance 32019. Resolution 283, raffle license for the Madison High School um, PTSO for a 50-50 on J January 30th. And uh, Resolution 284, endorsing the Madison Yard Sale um, Townwide yard sale on October 19th, which is uh, sponsored by the Environmental Commission. Quite a few resolutions, so you now know what's in the consent agenda. Anyone wishing to comment on any of those resolutions or the agenda items, please step forward, state your name, your address, the agenda item you're commenting on, and try to keep your comments to three minutes or less, but I'll give you a one minute grace period. If you want to comment on anything else, that will be coming up after the hearing of ordinances. Anyone wishing to comment, please step forward. Welcome, Tom. Right. <clears throat> I'm Harold Lampoutis, 27 Pomeroy Road. Uh, so happy to be here. Sorry I missed uh, Ben's event yesterday. I was at my own memorial service in Long Island, actually. Ironically, somebody else I know. I, I wanted to comment and try and understand a little better this ordinance about the single-use plastic bags. It's a pretty long ordinance, so this, I don't think I could cover it in three or four minutes. But uh, I, I like the idea, personally, because I've seen it implemented around the world in places where I do business. And uh, it is a little, uh, there's some resistance to it in the beginning, but eventually people get used to it. It's just a matter of training ourselves how to shop. But some of the implications here, I'm not really sure how the borough would enforce it. You're probably discussing it yourselves too. So one observation I made, and I, and I don't know if this is in here and I couldn't find it. There's a lot of home delivery services now, like a, like a Peapod, as an example. And when they bring you groceries, they might bring you like 100 bags. I don't know if anybody's used the services, but we use it sometimes. So yeah. I'm not sure how you could actually supervise and I like the idea of them bringing the food in some containers that they could just give you and maybe take the containers back. So there's, there's one where, area where there is really a lot of waste. Um, and then you have some exemptions here like takeout food. It says here is exempt, but you know, what's the difference if I go to the supermarket and I go to Salabar and I get food from there and take it home or if I get it from a, supermarket, from a restaurant? So I'm not really sure if that should be an exemption. Um, another area, I, I should probably just send you guys a message too about it, but I just wanna just stir a little discussion amongst everybody. Um, and then also the uh, one section about how the establishments should charge the customers for taking a bag or having to take a bag Depends on the store, I guess, but that could also get a little sticky. Mm -hmm. Some stores and uh, with some customers, maybe eventually they'll figure out that they should just be bringing their own bags to shop. And I'm not sure how you can enforce that. Then it also says in here that you, once, once I charge somebody, that's going to be part of the sales tax. It's going to be also on top of that. So I'm not sure if that's, it's very minuscule, but maybe in the big scope of things, if you have $10,000 a month of charges for bags, it could add up to some, some money for our residents to have to pay that penalty. Um, what else? I like the education part. I, I'm curious to know how the borough could help in educating residents. Maybe we start schools or I don't, I don't even know. In the electric utility bills, I guess you'll send out messages too. But I want to just say that I, I am in support of it. I think that it's not a bad. Uh, resolution or bad change. It's a good change. One minute. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the other the other thing I, I didn't really read up about it, about the whole implementation of, oh, also like a Bottle Hill Day. So all of the merchants of Bottle Hill Day, do they have to bring paper bags? If I go shopping at a merchant's booth a Bottle Hill Day, uh, maybe you already figured that out. But if you didn't, 
that you have a year to figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I saw that. And the farmer's market also is another place. Um, yeah, the, other, the other thing I just wanted to learn a little bit more about your whole recycling proposition. I know you're going to put some recycling opportunities for the borough residents in front of DBW, but I, I still don't understand why, what it entails. Like, I, I never used, I guess, the recycling center before over there. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you very much. We'll, we'll cover as we uh, introduce the ordinance and um, have a discussion. We'll, I think we're, we'll, we'll get to all, all the things you brought up. Anyone else wish, wishing to speak on the items on the agenda? Um, there, yeah, it's, it was actually not part of this discussion. And as chair of the chair of the environmental commission, I'll, I can call you up at, uh, during the actual discussion, so others can um, comment during the general comment period. Thank you for any. Uh, with that, I will close this part of the meeting, and we will move on to our discussion items. Borough surplus policy. Jim. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm going to go through real quickly some slides that were previously presented. Uh, numbers have been confirmed in terms of surplus when we were discussing these back during the budget um, hearings in earlier in the year. Um, they were estimates and then revised estimates, but they've been confirmed through the audit. Uh, I'm not going to read slides or go through everything. This is up on Rosenet. It will be up on Rosenet again. Don't worry, I'm not reading this. It's just what is surplus <laughs> um, in case people want to uh, uh, learn a little more about it, how it works. Um, but this is a chart that shows municipal surplus and surplus that was generated in 2018. You'll see on line seven, um, there was 5.9 million in surplus that was generated. That was significantly more um, than we've experienced in the prior years. And that was, uh, that was, it was expected to be flat, but instead we had a $1 million increase uh, in surplus. And what generated that extra surplus? Uh, it was interest rates increasing significantly and balances that the borough had uh, in the bank accounts due to people prepaying taxes. Um, so interest earned was 200000 more than expected, and we had over $450,000 of KRE uh, pilot payment revenue. Uh, during the budget time, we did not know and could not confirm how much was going to be coming in, but very soon after the budget was adopted in 2018, um, pilot revenue started to come in. So that caused a significant one-time bump in our surplus. And uh, as has been the case for a number of years, the department heads were fiscally responsible. We didn't have any emergent situations, large snowstorms or anything like that. As a result, not all of the 2017 budget was spent, and that becomes surplus as it lapses at the end of 2018. So surplus is generated three ways. Um, it's generated through when actual revenues exceed budgeted revenues. An example, we assume that we're going to get $500,000 in construction code fees. We have to be conservative. It turns out we get 800000 in construction code fees because we had a good year. We had maybe a large development um, like the parking lot at Allergan. Those $300,000 become surplus. Those lines are reflected on the chart. Um, it's when uh, current year taxes um, collected exceed what is budgeted. That's typically the reserve for uncollected tax. And then finally, as I mentioned before, it's cancellation of unspent lines from the 2017 budget. And we don't have uh, a serious, as many snow events. Um, for example, the line that we have for rock salt has extra money in it. That money lapses into, uh, into surplus at the end of the year. If an employee retires, um, that lapses. If we, we don't know what the price of gas is going to be throughout the year, so we tend to assume that it's, it could go up. If gas prices stay stable, then our fuel line has extra money in it, and at the end of uh, the following year, it lapses. So those are really the three ways that surplus are generated. Um, we have a guideline, thanks to the strategic planning guidelines that were um, generated by Ben Wolkowitz and the volunteers. Um, that we've been uh, dealing with for a number of years. And that guideline states that municipal surplus should be no more than 25% of total appropriations. So we saw in 2016 and 2017, we were a little bit over. In 2018 um, and uh, the beginning of 2019, we're significantly over that. So 
uh, we took uh, it, it, it may look as though the guideline is trending in the wrong direction, but having more surplus is a sign of financial stability, so I don't want people to think that, that it's bad from a financial standpoint. It's just that it's above the guidelines, and the guidelines give us uh, a little bit of better understanding as we monitor it to make sure that we are setting the budget up properly. So to resolve that imbalance, Council took significant steps during the 2019 budget cycle by authorizing the following actions. Um, we increased anticipated revenues in the budget. Remember I talked about construction code anticipating 500000 but 800 comes in? The following year, if we anticipate 600000 that would generate less surplus. Uh, same situation um, with, uh, um, I should say, with utilizing additional surplus in the budget of $267,000, uh, we're drawing down on the surplus balances. It's so one item that's not in here I should have added, which is we budget more closely on the appropriation lines. So we may not have as much um, extra cushion in the snow removal line or in the fuel line um, and that by doing that reduces the amount of surplus that's generated and then finally those items naturally cause the budget to evolve to where a zero percent tax increase is possible so this past year council passed a zero percent tax increase those actions there are already taking significant steps to maintain surplus balance and, and reduce the growth. Keep in mind that we used um, $5.2 million of surplus in the budget and uh, we are over $5 million of surplus in the budget and we generated 5.9 last year, but we had 450000 from carry and 200 in interest. So I do believe that we'll be in a situation where the amount that we're using is uh, close to the amount that we're generating, and that's the goal here. So we had an ad hoc committee um, with members of council and administration and others, and we met with Steve Rogan, our bond council, who will be here this evening, and our auditor to discuss surplus and the issues. Um, we did a, an extensive study of all the towns that were AAA in um, New Jersey, and we compiled and reviewed their surplus and compared them to Madison. Um, uh, and the analysis came up with the following, that surplus as a percent of the budget ranged from 10 to 40 percent. Madison is 32 percent, so we're on the high end of that range. Free balance as a percent of the budget ranged from 3.4 percent to 33 percent. Madison's right in the middle there. Um, in general, Madison is within range, but on towards the high end. As such, it was appropriate for Madison and for the council to do what you did during the budget, which is to try to look towards reducing surplus generation in a moderate and thoughtful and programmatic way. There was uh, one uh, town in the next chart that was just for whatever reason way off the chart, so we removed them statistically. Upper Freehold Township has a lot of free balance and a lot of budgeted surplus. This will be uh, online. I know it's just impossible for people to read here, but this is every town. Madison, Allendale, Bernardsville, Mendham Township, Montclair, Princeton, Summit, Upper Freehold, Warren Township, Westfield, quality towns that all are AAA rated that we analyzed uh, those two metrics compared to our metric to see are we really out of line, and the answer was we're on the high end. So uh, with that, we do have uh, our bond counsel, Steve Rogut, who um, gave an excellent, had an excellent discussion in the subcommittee, and I wanted to bring him back for a return performance to have him talk a little bit about his experience working with other municipalities and his experience working with uh, the rating agencies, because a lot of what we do here is looked at um, by the rating agencies so we can maintain our AAA. Welcome. Thank you, Jim. Well, I th think your presentation was uh, was very, very thorough. So I'll try to be I'll try to be brief. Um, you know, Madison surplus of Oops. approaching thirty percent, uh, you know, is a strong surplus. Uh, the rating agencies look at things on a national basis. So um, when you compare New Jersey municipalities to the rest of the country. Uh, we're actually sort of towards the lower end of surpluses for, for AAA. So you need to keep that in mind. But what, look, what could seem to be a, a huge number in, for us is really on a national basis, um, uh, you know, sort of towards the lower end. 
Uh, for Standard & Poor's, where we have our AAA rating, a 25% uh, surplus is the median uh, surplus amount. So our policy maximum of 25% is right in line with the median uh, surplus. Also, Standard & Poor's, uh, when we get a rating from them, they have sort of a checklist, like a scorecard. And 25% uh, is, uh, you know, the median for them. Uh, it gets us, in, gets us the highest score in the, uh, in the uh, surplus category. But if we have 30%, we get, an, we get bonus points, which could offset uh, other areas where we would have deficiencies or be scored lower. Uh, we have no such uh, deficiencies, but it's just something to keep in mind that 30% uh, gets, you, gets you a bonus points. Um, in dealing with the rating agencies, what they're really most interested in is long-term trends. They want to see that um, uh, you continually operate on a positive basis. They want to see that your revenues exceed your expenditures on a yearly basis. They go back many years in looking at things, and they're also looking for, for long-term trends. So uh, this structural balance, as it's called, is, is very, very important. And what you're in the process of doing is sort of narrowing the amount of surplus that you generate, additional surplus you generate every year. Um, that's something that they certainly uh, you know, respect and understand, but they want to see that you maintain uh, a positive operating result. They don't want a situation where we're looking at using surplus and from their point of view draining the surplus in order to pay for our operating, our ordinary expenses. The other point I'd like to add is that uh, the rating agencies um, expect, you know, obviously they look, they've been a, a around a long time and they've seen, all of us have seen a lot of things occur over the years, so they're, they're looking at possible uses of surplus. They don't view it as purely some abstract number that you just squirrel away with no thought of ever using it. Uh, over the years, we've seen all kinds of, uh, you know, recessions. We've seen uh, natural disasters. Uh, we see fluctuations in uh, various kinds of revenues that we have. So if we went into a recession <clears throat> and the tax collection rate dropped, they'd like, they would like to see that surplus money available to be used to smooth things out at that point. As we know, in New Jersey, we're limited in the amount that we can raise taxes. We have spending, we have tax caps, and we have spending caps. So surplus is, is something that's available to deal with extraordinary circumstances. We could have a significant uh, drop in construction, uh, building permits, et cetera. So those revenues could go down. The way that uh, interest expense went up uh, as interest rates went up and also we got a lot of extra money from the prepayment of taxes. Again, in interest investment earnings can go way down as we're sort of in the process of interest rates going back down. So those, uh, that item could lessen. Um, also, surplus is important if you uh, have some extraordinary piece of litigation or some other extraordinary expense. Um, dealing with the housing issue that all the municipalities are dealing with, uh, there's potential for municipalities to come out of pocket in providing your fair housing obligation. So really the rating agency's view is that it takes a long time to build up surplus and it's a sign of, of good management that you every year can estimate your expenditures and also estimate your revenues and operate on a positive fashion. Um, but they're cognizant that um, you know, draining surplus is something, or, or use of surplus is something that does occur and, um, you know, will need to be managed if, if you're in that situation. Uh, another, just as an example, um, we've had municipalities where um, in, in slow economic times, uh, property values stagnate. Uh, property values go down. Um, it does happen. And we've had towns where there have been massive waves of tax appeals both on commercial and residential. And we've seen surplus be drawn down and used for that purpose uh, because um, basically you have to give the money back from overtaxing people. So there's various things that, that, that can happen. Uh, I think that the surplus levels that you have now um, uh, 
are certainly uh, commendable. The 30, the 25 percent is, is really sort of a, uh, it's the median and kind of a, a close to a minimum to really get the conversation started to uh, to have a AAA credit rating. Thank you. Before any we go questions? to discussion, any uh, questions for Steve? Yeah, I mean, Jim, could you go to the chart that has all the towns on it for a second? It's not very clear, Pat, and I apologize, but whoops. No, so I think the last one or second to last one. There you go. So I was looking at this, and I actually sorted it based on the free balance. And I thought it was interesting that towns like Summit were living with a free balance of only 2% and a surplus balance of 16%. Ridgewood used surplus balance of 10%, free balance of 2.4%, yet they're all AAA rated. How were they able to maintain a AAA rating with such a low sort of margin of error? If you look at Ridgewood and Summit? Well, some of these, Pat, it depends on when the, they obtained their AAA rating. If they attained it in 2013 when the financials were different, that could certainly be an indication of one thing. And, as, and I'll let Steve answer the rest. There's a lot of things that go into the rating. I mean, well, Ridgewood and Summit, like Madison, have uh, very high wealth levels. Mm -hmm. So you get, you get a lot of credit for um, just your overall economic situation. Those factors are more important. Okay. Uh, you know, the wealth levels of the, of this, of, of the residents, uh, the types of industry, the type of jobs that people have, how close you are to New York City. Mm -hmm. All those things are important. And those factors, uh, you know, those factors are, are, are very important. Um, I, th you know, I, the, the numbers probably have fluctuated. Probably both of those municipalities at, at times had much higher surpluses. I don't know where they're trending. Uh, I do know that, um, you know, let's say several, three to four years of drawing down surplus. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're operating at a structural imbalance, you know, then you will get a, you, you will get a call from the mm -hmm. agency and they'll want to know what's going on. You, you really, um, they look at everybody every year and um, if you're drawing it down, you need to have a good reason. I mean, you can certainly, the fact that we're over the surplus, um, you know, there are reasonable things that you can do with surplus to draw it down to, to a level of, um, that uh, a level that the rating agency is comfortable with and that you can explain to them what you're doing with that money. And okay. We, we, we did get one of those calls, if I recall, that mm -hmm. we were drawing down more surplus than we were creating and so it was a structural deficit that we created in our budget and that was one of the things we had to address to get back to our AAA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Robert used all of his charm but uh, did go on for a few years and then yeah. we had to tell him we were going to turn it around and, and, and the, the borough did. Yeah, I, I think we kind of hit rock bottom around 2011, 2012. I think that's when we were threatened with losing our AAA bond rate. We never actually lost it at the time. We actually had under a million dollars of just borrow surplus. I think by 2012 we had a million and a half. We're now, I think in 2018, we're at two, four and a half. It, it's not reflected on here because this only goes through 2017. But, you know, we've continuously grown it. If it was just a one-year issue, I wouldn't have raised it. But I, I started several years ago because the trend has been going in what I would consider a very positive direction. And I said it's not a... It's not like a, the type of problem where the building's on fire, but on the other hand, every dollar that we're holding on to is money that was given to us by the taxpayers, the ratepayers, expecting we're using it to operate the budget and maintain a prudent surplus. And so the question I really have is, what's the right number? Um, I actually went back and looked at the initial report that the, um, the budget committee gave us. And at the time, they actually did have a, a fund balance surplus um, guideline that never actually appeared in their final thing and they they talked about having sort of a Goldilocks situation and at the time they were looking at the a variety of our accounts and saying it should be between 20 and 30 percent when I did the same calculation today depending on how you count it we're at least at 28 and possibly as sorry talking too long possibly as high as 35 or 40 percent so you know whether we're at the high end of the range or over the range you know, my, my position has been that we have more money than we really should be holding on to. I think we should have a policy. Like I said, this didn't become a guideline, but we should have one. So I don't know if 
the initiative tonight is to just kind of move this aside or to move to the next step of actually trying to drive to some sort of policy on how much money the borough should hold on to in all its various accounts. Uh, go ahead, yeah, some of this will be setting the tone as we once again enter the uh, budgeting cycle. So this, uh, this is one reason why they have the timing of this now is so we, uh, as we start looking at 2019 and I mean we are 2019. Let's <laughs> 2020. And that was kind of my point back in February and March and April and, and the reason you know the February 11th minutes appeared is because I knew we had started it. I went back and watched the video. I raised the issue and our reaction was not really a, what I would consider a thoughtful one. It was yes it was a reaction. We went to a zero percent increase. We added some more money to the um, to the dividend, but we never really came up with a policy. And I expect that over the last six months we would have worked towards that. And I really didn't want to go into next year's budget, not having the administration have it like around now so they would know what they're targeting everything at by this time next year. So I was hoping we would continue to work on that as a committee and bring back to council something that we kind of either all agreed on or at least the majority of people agreed on. So. Um Managing surplus is a little bit like driving an ocean liner, um, you know, and you only get to touch the controls one time a year, really. Correct. Yeah. Um, so we touch the controls during the budget season mm -hmm. and during the budget process, and so we we took action this past budget process, and uh, I think it will have to review surplus again and the generation. And if we're in a situation where we generate. We generated less surplus. Let's say we generate 4.8 million, but we used 5 million in the budget. Then we're in a situation where the surplus is going to be declining, and we'll have to manage that slowly—a slow decline to a certain point till we get back into that 25 to 30 percent range. As Steve said, we wouldn't want to have a huge drop off. There will be opportunities um, if we want to look to draw down additional surplus in a one-time fashion that's not on an operating basis, but is on a capital basis. That is, there's an additional capital item. If, if the council wanted to advance one or two additional capital items that would uh, be funded by this surplus, that's a possibility of doing that. But I am concerned about some of the potential systemic issues. Uh, there's obviously some potential pension issues down the road, not so much with the local um, municipal pension obligation, but with the state obligation, and could that somehow be offloaded onto the towns? The affordable housing obligation uh, right now uh, we are hopeful that we'll be using low-income tax credits to fund the 40 units. If we don't, we'll need to come up with $4 million or more. So having the surplus gives us uh, a, a way to fund that over a number of years. So I think there's always issues. I think we're being thoughtful and throttling back on it, and I think the policy should be to continue to press the levers that we need to press to work towards getting it into the 25 to 30 percent range. And I think any, I think including the policy would be if a structural deficit is a way to reduce the um, a uh, the, the surplus. It's got to you've, you've got to have a way to get out of that structural surplus. So you you know if, okay we're going to be. Uh, structurally short by 300000 for the next three years, well, eventually you got to create that $300,000 and so mm -hmm. you have to have that well, way to get out. Well, we, we actually have a really easy way of doing all that because if we're moving money between the utilities and the general budget, we can just stop transferring as much money over and then transfer more. You know, the, the one thing that is not held captive to state 2% guidelines is the utilities. And so, you know, a lot of the money that's been moving into the borough budget and a lot of the money that's been funding the surplus is really coming from there because we have not raised property taxes, the tax rate significantly in the last six years. I think it averaged about a half a percent a year. We've had a couple zeros. It's a very low number. So the money is kind of washing over. And it takes a couple years because it, it becomes surplus one year in the electric utility, then it gets moved over to the borough, and then the next year it becomes surplus there. So. Yes, we only get one chance to tap on the brakes, and that's why I'm saying we can't kind of shoot from the hip every year. We really should have a policy that we're driving towards, and if we have a, a, an imbalance in one direction or the other, we should really look at what are a couple of options that over the next couple of years could play out, as opposed to kind of saying, oh, wait, let's just do something because we're either too high or too low, and that's what we've been kind of doing. And like I said, this has been building up for a long period of time, and when you total up all the various kind of reserves and pots and things that we've kind of set aside, it's a lot of money. I would just say that I wouldn't use the, the phrase shoot from the hip, just me personally. I would say we have a thoughtful, programmatic way through the budget 
to work the surplus down in a way that doesn't create any sort of um, structural imbalance, but can be something that, that can be managed and, and looked at um, in a favorable way by the rating agencies. Um, during this budget, upcoming budget cycle, we'll have an understanding as to what happened in surplus this year uh, in February. And at that point in time, uh, we can look at possible ways to uh, create an upper band and say that, that we really, we're, we're beyond the upper band, what do we need to do? But I'm, I, I'm not going to make a bet or prognosticate, but I do feel as though the amount of surplus we're drawing down versus the amount that's going to be generated this year will, in, in my opinion, generate a, a reduction in surplus this year. Steve, we have any were you about to that, say? Oh, yeah. sorry. Just one more question. Do we have any more any indication, you know, year to date, that that's really what's going to happen? I mean, we're almost three quarters of the way through. You know, it's hard to look at that, Pat. It's uh, you know, lapsing appropriations can be looked at and other things, but it's it's not it's not easy because different things happen at different times of the year. So so I'm not able to um, to do that in a way that will give any sort of solid certainty until we're really done through through the rest of the year. All right. I, I think that's something else we should look at because. We only seem to get an indication once a year when we get our budget in, let's say, February, what the last year looked like. You know, during the course of the year, I guess we would know if we were running over, but we don't never we never know by how much we're running under in terms of expenses or how much we're running over in terms of revenue. And so it's it doesn't give us a lot of time to think about a good way to do anything. I think we have a short a short window. Yeah, what, what I want to do is try to get some other voices. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and Steve, did you have something to add or before I get? No, no, that's, okay. that's fine. Uh, other, oh. Yep, Austria. But what I heard tonight from Mr. Rogut is that 30% is acceptable, correct? Yeah, uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I have, it sounds I plenty, like. I have plenty of clients who have more surplus. Right. Than Madison and, does. and we're under that, and we're very close to our budget guideline, and our budget guideline sounds like we should discuss whether that should be raised. I mean, it's not going to hurt us. I mean, I, I just do think about the big issues like affordable housing and um, this, you know, some of the bigger projects that we have that we, we might want to use that surplus um, and um, to do. So I think we're... The, the, the point I, want, I was, wanted to add was that you get penalized for operating at a loss. You can have a very significant surplus. But once you start uh, not generating enough, not, not, once you start operating your budget at a loss, a lot of red flags go up with the rating agencies. So um, they would really want to see a good reason of what you're using that money for. And they do not want to see it happen for, for very long. Uh -huh. uh, and the steps that, that, you've, that you took in this year's budget I mean, it's quite possible that you've really narrowed the amount of money that you're going to, like, I guess 18, you generated 1.2 million. I don't want, uh, of positive uh, funds. Uh, it could be down to, you know, five or $600,000 this year, which is, you know, pretty close to even. Mm -hmm. So you might be solving part of the problem of, of an ever-growing surplus with the steps that you took this year. I, I know it's kind of frustrating that you have to wait for the end of the year results, but that's kind of, kind of the way it goes. Um, and then next year you could take further steps to, if you wanted to, to just narrow what you're, uh, uh, what you're going to generate in, in, in a positive uh, number. Um, and then, it, you know, there are things, really what I, wanted, what I wanted to add is there are things that happen, some of which none of us can predict. And that's why you have a surplus, and the rating agencies, they really think that at some point you will use that money um, for something unforeseen. I mean, uh, and, and some of these things you know, have occurred over time. I've had a town that flew through $10 million of surplus in two or three years with tax appeals. And they, before that happened, you would have never thought that that would have happened. Mm -hmm. But thankfully, they had that money. Um, you know, and then they, and then they built it back up. Yeah, before we go back to Pat, uh, others uh, comments that uh, yeah, one of the and I, I almost don't want to say this, but you know, certainly one of the things that concerns me, and until the additional tunnels are built under the Hudson River, if 
one of those, if the one or both tunnels fail, the property values along the railroad line will go down drastically and the appeals would go way up and towns that are not prepared for that will really be strapped. And so it, 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 no one knows what the future is, but when you're, you're ready for that future, you're much better off than uh, ignoring what can go wrong. John, and then we'll Yeah, excuse me uh, for being late in making and saying anything, but uh, one of the things I heard Pat ask for was perhaps to continue the, uh, the committee to you know, continue to study it a little bit and come up with uh, perhaps some recommendations. Uh, one of the, what I expected from this committee, in all honesty, was some recommendation for what should the, what should the surplus be. You know, some maybe revision of what the original strategic planning guideline was. You know, uh, but this is, I think this is what we've seen is fine, but I think it's, it's a, a representation, if you will, of what we've seen before. Not necessarily anything new or dramatic or that's going to change what we're doing. So my suggestion would be to continue with the, uh, with the committee and to come up with some kind of recommendation, right, wrong, or indifferent, about what they think it should be. That's where I'd come up. Pat, you, you. Yeah, I mean, the, the challenge you face as a government, as an elected body, is if you, everybody comes forward and tells you all the things that can go wrong, you'll find yourself hanging on to a gazillion dollars. Because someone can always put a disaster in front of you and say, well, what about this? You should have all the money for that. That's not really the way we're supposed to work. We're supposed to pick reasonable estimates of what could possibly happen and then factor in what the likelihood is and how much we want to set aside. I mean, we, we wrote out Hurricane Sandy in 2012 with a fraction of the money that we had without borrowing the money, significantly raising taxes from what I remember or scrimping on services. So, you know, we have money to cushion us against pretty catastrophic events. If it's something as bad as the tunnels failing and the, the property value is going down, I don't think there's a, an amount of money we can save to cushion the blow for that. I mean, it, th that becomes, I don't want to say a fool's errand because I don't want to characterize anybody that way, but it's, it's a real challenge. And so, you know, I, I look back historically and say, over the last seven years, we've increased what we've been hanging out in a variety of categories, quite a bit of money, uh, quite a bit. And I just would like to have a more thoughtful way of sort of drawing the line so that we're not just continuing to add money incrementally, moving it into reserves because, well, let's, since we have the money, let's, you know, hang on to it and, and, and earmark it for something. It's our, 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 the amount of money that we have in surpluses across all our accounts has grown a lot. Awesome. And I, I just, I'm astounded that I seem to be the only person who thinks that letting people keep more of their money is a good idea. I mean, I, I, I wonder if I hadn't opened my mouth in February and the budget had just gone through as is, the initial proposal was a 2% increase in property taxes, and I don't know if there was going to be any extra electrical dividend. So, you know, would we be even here having this conversation if I didn't say something? I, I, I would, uh, I, I know this is the uh, fall season, I would venture to say, I think that probably would have happened anyway with, uh, as we looked at the numbers, there was a lot of good, good brains at the table here and realizing that um, the uh, dividend, and, as um, I prefer calling it, a rate, a rate adjustment was well warranted and uh, there was no need to go to 2%, so uh, although I thank you for bringing up the conversation that I think we would have ended up in the same spot, so. Uh, Austri, and then... Uh, yeah, I mean, Pat, you were the one who mentioned 2011 when we were down, our surplus was way down. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I remember having to make the difficult decision. I was on the council where we had to have a, a, a rather large tax increase. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've heard that, you know, we put together a good committee that made a guideline that said you can, you know, continue to generate this level of of surplus, it's going to help your triple A bond rating, mm -hmm. and if you if you don't have a, a, a good sizable surplus, um, what are our alternatives? Um, we could increase taxes to cover the shortfall. Uh, we could reduce services. We could reduce personnel. I think the people of Madison expect a certain level of service, and uh, I think they ex like how we had 0% tax increase last year. And 
you know, we, we continue to remain within the guidelines of how much surplus we have. So I, I don't see that it's, you know, I think we should always study it and revisit it. I think that's a good thing, but I think we're in a good position. Uh, good. Jeb? I agree that we can't be prepared for every disaster, and we could play the hypothetical game. I mean, Texas just had 40 inches of rain dumped on them in 24 hours or whatever it was. But I think having been through the 2010 disaster that was the school board um, situation with budgets, um, I think that's something that needs to be thought about. We're not in total control, but for me the bigger thing right now is the affordable housing. And while we do have to watch our surplus, and I agree, we need to monitor it, we have this chunk of money that we know could potentially, if we don't get those credits, that we're going to have to lay out. And Jim's saying it's $4 million, it could be more than that. We've committed to these 40 units. I don't know what the cost would be. But if we have to purchase land, if we have to do whatever the case may be, that to me is a concrete thing that we know in the next two years we've got to cross that bridge. We're hoping to get tax credits, but if we don't, we've got to pay for it. And having that surplus while monitoring it and making sure we're not increasing it more, I think just makes the most sense. Jim? I would just say I think uh, the council as a, as a governing body should be proud that we have these types of discussions and that we have this type of policy because there are very few towns in the state of New Jersey, very few CFOs that I know that have this type of high level discussion about something that's very important that explain it to the residents that, that have a, a thoughtful conversation and that have a guideline that allows us to uh, go into a budget and determine and make decisions based on surplus. I can tell you that, the va and I'm sure Steve would tell you, the vast majority of towns, the CFOs may know, may know it, but they don't have intentional conversations or a set policy. If you were to Google surplus policy New Jersey or even surplus policy municipal government, couple in California, a couple here, a couple there, there are very few that are out there that are actually published. We're one of the few. So, so just, to, and we'll go one more, I, th I think we've um, obviously more work to do as we, we get into the uh, bu bu budget season. Um, I, I do want to remind everyone that, uh, you know, this uh, surplus has been generated in a time with uh, very small tax increases or none at all. So it's, um, we've, we've been man managing the, uh, the, the tax burden, uh, I think, very, very well. It's certainly... Um, to go to a tax decrease to take care of a uh, surplus creates a major um, problem down the line. So it's, I think it's, we have a very well thought out uh, thing and I'm, I'm not ignoring the ideas of, uh, you know, a structured policy going forward so we understand and can balance the unexpected things. Yeah, we don't know what tomorrow will bring and we can't, you can never have enough money in the bank for it all, so, but you don't ignore it. I did hear, uh, you know, one point someone said we don't, we don't insure the art because it's priceless in, in, in an example. And, and, you know, that's ignoring, so that's not a, uh, a good approach. We need to, to be mindful and, um, you know, again, we're in a great position to be able to have this conversation. You know, there's 555 towns in uh, this state mm -hmm. that would uh, love to have the conversation. Pat, and then we'll try to wrap it up. So a couple things. One, by no means was I suggesting that we need to significantly raise property taxes or the electric rate or cut services. I think the money's there that we don't have to do that. Um, I do appreciate, Jim, all the work you do. And it actually helps me understand this and get to actually the conclusion I come to. You know, you provide a lot of information. I do some additional analysis. And so it's not as if I, I'm saying you're hiding this information from anybody. You actually present it very well. I just happen to view it slightly differently. Um, and I think, again, I, I've actually said since 2014 when I started serving that my preference was not to cut the property taxes because I do recognize having served on the Board of Education in 2012, being the finance chair and having to figure out how to cut all that money out of the budget, at least we had a very solid property tax base to maintain most of what we were doing. Um, I'm actually concerned that we have actually whittled our property tax down to a, very, a fairly small portion of what we should be collecting to run the borough because we've been moving a lot of money from the electric utility over. And if there was a serious downturn or we had serious issues with 
electricity pricing down the road, and luckily we're pretty far out, um, it is going to hit residents a lot harder than it should. So um, I, I just, again, I take a look at all the numbers, and I think, number one, we should make sure we're reporting to everybody on it total basis what we have. We should go back to, and take a look at that fund balance surplus recommendation that they initially had put together and, and start to analyze what we currently have because I think you'll find that we do have quite a bit of money compared to what I think they initially thought was at least the bottom. And finally, I will say to Mr. Roga, thank you very much. And I appreciate your giving us the information about the, um, the rating agencies, but you know they're mainly concerned about their bondholders getting repaid. We need to be concerned about what our taxpayers are paying and make sure that they're not overpaying just to keep the bondholders happy. So well, that's uh, my final statement. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. We, I'll just, just, it's just, it's not, uh, just wanted to add one of the uncertainties we deal with really has to do with the state of New Jersey. Thanks, man. Um, I mean, the state is in the single A rated category. Mm -hmm. One of the concerns the rating agency has, you know, as Jim mentioned, is, is with pensions. So there's a general fear that the well-funded municipal pension mm -hmm. system could wind up getting merged with the state, or w which would increase our contributions, or that the assumptions on returns that they've made in the pension system aren't going to be realized. So. You know, you could get a higher pension bill next year, get a higher health insurance bill. So having surplus, that would be a use where you could smooth things out and not have a, uh, you know, a huge tax increase. So these types of things, you know, can happen. You know, the borough's in very, very good shape, and it's certainly a policy decision you have to, you know, for you to make. We do, having a policy is important. It shows that the town is well managed. We have, a high, we have the highest management score possible from Standard & Poor's because we have a lot of written policies. So whatever you decide, you know, uh, it's certainly Thank your decision. You. <laughs> Thank you. We're set? Okay. Uh, Move on. I can go on with the light, but I'm going to stop. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll talk more. There will be plenty more opportunities as we get into later in the year. Health services. Okay. Uh, on tonight's consent agenda, resolution 274 is to approve um, the administration to go ahead and uh, huh? negotiate the, finish negotiating um, the okay. contracts. So we just want to go over a little bit with an overview of what the health um, services do, how the Board of Health plays into it, and where we're headed. Health services, there are four main services, the health officer, the REHS inspections, the health education, and our public health nursing. So as we entered into contract negotiations, we were looking at um, maintaining public safety, um, improving public safety, and maintenance of the current level of services. We didn't want any changes for the Madison residents. We want to retain our current borough staff, and then we wanted to identify a solution that was financially viable and offered long-term stability. As we went through the process, um, this process actually started two years ago, and a thank you to Pat, who started this process while he was um, council liaison to the Board of Health. We've had conversations with several municipal health departments, the county health officer, George Van Orden, who's a retired health officer and also a Madison resident, about how best to proceed. The Board of Health has discussed the various options, and they do support the following recommendation. Our recommendation is to renew our contract with Bloomfield, um, and to, to not renew our contracts to provide services to the other towns, ending our provider relationship as their contracts expire. Um, so we're going to get out of the provider business um, to other towns. With our health services, our goals, like I said, are public safety and maintenance of the current level of services. Madison is a high service community. The health department, in addition to those health services for Madison, does deal with our public nuisances and our property maintenance complaints. Food inspectors typically visit resident restaurants multiple times a year. And again, there will be no changes to services for Madison residents under the proposed agreement. The clinics that we maintain, that will all continue, the flu clinics, the rabies clinics, um, the blood testing that's done. Again, we're going to retain our current borough staff. Our staff are well respected. They know our community. They also, our public health nurse has a great relationship with Drew University and then with all our public and parochial schools. 
Uh, again, with our goals, we wanted to identify a solution that was financially viable and offer long-term stability. Current plan is in line with our existing budget. Other viable options that we identified were the contract with, account, with the county, with Morris County. The cost was not only over $50,000 more, it also was a lower level of service. We would not be providing the same service to our Madison residents. The other option that was looked at was a hiring a health officer and part-time RAHS inspector. That would cost over $100,000 more um, with that option. Contracts with other communities cause long-term financial instability. Our current model with brokering Bloomfield Health Officer Services to Madison, contract towns is not preferred by the state, and our proposed contract with Bloomfield is a five-year term. After January 1, 2021, the contract may be terminated with six months' notice by either party should things change at that point. Questions? All right. Well done. So it's, and I thank you for your work. And uh, Eric Range, the uh, uh, president of the Board of Health, for his work, he had to head out. He would have been here otherwise. Um, as I point out, this has been a couple of years uh, in, in the process, and uh, so and it's started a lot of it with Pat. So go ahead. I'll give you. Yes, yeah, so I'm not going to ask any questions, but I want to thank you. Um, I, a couple of things that really struck me, the two years I served on the Board of Health, the first year I kind of observed, and you know, one of the issues we faced is that the state did not really approve the model that we had. Ray got us an exception, but we weren't really sure how long if, or if that could continue. Um, the second thing is, if you go back a long way, we used to be a big regional provider of health care services. That has slowly winnowed down to a handful of towns, and we started to actually get concerned year to year. We lost Chatham Borough. Was some of the, were some of the other towns going to stick around? Should Ray and Jim spend all their time trying to find replacement towns every time we lost somebody? So it seemed to me we were barely treading water, and that you know, in an ideal world, the state would mandate that the county runs the health department for anybody <laughs> under a certain size, you know, 100,000 people, whatever. It's crazy that everybody has to have their own. There should be a county-run, regional-based system. Um, they'll get there someday, but um, not today. So we needed to make a decision. Um, the feeling was we would look at the county and, and other local providers and become just a consumer. And I think where we are at with this contract is actually a good sort of first step into that world. You know, over time we can reevaluate this contract and see if the state changes its mind about how the counties operate. Um, and but it'll it'll take us out of this sort of dual world that I didn't think we really were doing well in. Um, and so I appreciate the work you guys did to get this across the finish line. So thank you very much. Thank you, and I appreciate the transition you met with me between election day and when I took the position. So I went in knowing kind of what was there, which was helpful. I was able to come in um, somewhat educated. And also thank you to Ray and Jim and everybody else yes. who helped negotiate this. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? So this will be resolution 274, which will authorize um, administration to you know, bring the contract to the finish line and come back to the uh, council with the actual contract under the guidelines and services that uh, Deb had outlined. Electric, electric vehicle charging station. Thanks. Lisa. What did you guys do before laptops when you could just rotate the, right. <laughs> the computer around? Maybe you could buy a couple more laptops. Um, okay, this is very brief. As you probably know, the state uh, runs a grant program called it, it Pays to Plug In. This grant program has been funded by through the Volkswagen settlement of which New Jersey received over $77 million. This spring, um, the state decided to release just over $11 million. Um, the focus is to improve the electric vehicle infrastructure in the state with the ultimate goal of uh, reducing greenhouse gases and improving uh, air quality. So um, last fall, uh, Karsten Wittrup and Claire Whitcomb brought to us the, um, this program and kind of got us up to speed on where we needed to be to take part in this. We, uh, in order to file for the grant, we had to decide on which charging station models we wanted. We had to identify locations, etc. We 
Um, we worked with Karsten on filing the grant, which was finalized on Valentine's Day of 2019 and submitted a week later on February 21st. Um, the, uh, after a, a very long period of time and a lot of unanswered emails to NJDP, we were notified in late August that we were actually included in um, the grant receipts. Hey. Um, so, and the paperwork was received just last week. Uh, hold on. These were the locations we decided on. Um, the Maple Avenue lot here next door to the building. We also, uh, just so you know, we did bring Jimmy Matina and Russ Brown into this process. We drove around town and, and picked these locations, which we thought were probably, well, they're all a government owned, which increases your uh, percentage of a war to up to 100%. So Waverly Green, Cook Avenue lot, Madison Rec, Creation Complex, and the library. They're all good locations that are um, that will not take a, a, a huge project to install. Um, so we're looking forward to that. Cook Avenue will be put off until the uh, the lot is reconstructed, whenever that happens. So that'll be included in that process. Lisa, did we ask the school district if they were interested in having one situated or sited on one of their lots? Yeah. Uh, no, we did not. They, uh, there was nothing, I don't believe, precluding them from applying for the grant themselves. Okay. And maybe that's something they can be encouraged to do in the future uh, if this program continues, which I imagine it should since we only spent a, a small fraction of the money. So we decided on, with Karsten's help, we decided on this unit, which is the most um, widely used and, and sort of easiest to use. There's not that many, I was kind of surprised when I did the research that there are not a lot of um, uh, companies and it drops off from a really high number for this company to a much, much lower for the second kind of producer of these. So I, I'm sure in time that will change. Uh, we already had met with the rep and got quotes. That was all had to be done in order to submit the grant. Um, Great unit, great looking unit, uh, very highly um, sophisticated as far as nationwide network and, and things like that. Um, it's also all the electric costs will be passed on to the consumer and that's all done through software, um, you know, sort of a, you, you kind of join a, this network Please, before you go on, does this do all electric vehicles? I know like the, the Tesla Teslas, ones you only will need do Tesla? an adapter. Okay. But like the Prius and the, I don't know what they yeah. all are. It does all of them. Okay. Yeah. All right. So as I said, this is a reimbursement grant. We had to choose the model and the locations, which we did. This is a reimbursement grant. So you had to have everything, all your ducks in a row and, and ready to go. Uh, before the grant was submitted, which we did, um, and we should get an 100% uh, up to the maximum of $6,000 per dual port level two charging stations. So the next step is for you guys to approve the, accept, uh, vote to approve this grant, and then we're going to have to do some work with, um, with Linda Sawyer when she gets back as far as purchasing. Karsten also reached out. He has, he feels like there's some new little things going on in the market that we need to understand. So we will meet with him um, probably, you know, next week or the week after to discuss that. And then we have to set up a plan for installation probably in the spring at this point. Um, but that that's kind of where we are. Question, uh, Pat and then Deb. So a couple questions. The first is we're also appropriating thirty thousand dollars 
are we only going to be spending that money if we get authorization from the state to reimburse us? That appropriation ordinance is going to cover us in case we have any extra expenses and allow us to pre-fund this so we can move forward with this. And then um, when we get the revenue back, we can have that um, uh, those funds go back to back into the general capital improvement. That's typical with our like our road project. Like road project. We, we exactly. appropriate. 100% and then uh, the state, when they pay us a year later, we put that back in. But do we, I mean, normally we get a letter from the state authorizing us a certain size grant. Do we have the same level of commitment from this legal commitment from the state to reimburse us? We have a stack this big of paper and app, an actual application. That's why we're having exactly that we're well, signing an, application. an agreement we, with the state. We have state a letter managers. from the state saying if you do X, we will give you Y. Exactly. That's what the agreement okay. is. Yes. That's what I want to be sure. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. the other question is, uh, you said that the user is going to bear the cost. So we're going to provide the electricity. The company, I guess, who puts this unit in will actually charge the end user. Are they reimbursing us for the electricity that we provide? It's been months since I met. we met with the rep. We have to have him back in. And once he comes back in and we get all the details ironed back out, I'll let you know. Um, I forget that detail, truthfully. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, the, but Lisa, as I recall, the goal was we were going to charge this capture point as the largest distributor of these, so a lot of uh, owners of electric vehicles have the app on their phone, can on look at it and go, oh, I'm, I'm heading to my friend's house in Chatham. Oh, I'll stop off at the Madison Library, top off, sit at the library for an hour, read some magazines or newspapers, and head on my way. But they will be charged. We will get revenue back, which will offset the um, electricity. And we're able to actually, through that app, see usage, utilization, and get an understanding as to how much money is coming in versus how much money is going. So the, the, the vendor collects and then, then pays us for the power. Yeah, and it's all it's all cloud-based and, and stuff. There's not a lot of, there's not, um, you know, kind of, we don't have to run uh, fiber to these units or something. Oh, no, like I'd expect it to all be wireless. I just yeah. want to, so they'll, we don't actually have to put a meter on each of these units. Mm -hmm. They'll no. self-report to us what was consumed. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, the demonstration was really interesting, and maybe at some point we could, we could have them come here and do a demonstration. That would be good. A Deb, and then Maureen. With the, you, you touched on my question. The Cook Avenue lot, is that, and Jim, I don't know if you remember, when is that slated to, is that next summer that that's slated to be redone? We're, we're hoping we're in, the, we're in the design process. Yeah, so we're, yeah. But the reason I'm asking is my question is, is if we start in the spring, which obviously we need to do, and then we don't get to Cook Avenue next summer, and it's maybe the next, that's going to delay, the reimbursement's when it's all done. No, we have to. We have to buy the. Once we buy the units, doesn't mean we have to. So we install them. So, so we, we we would have the Cook Avenue unit in our ready possession to go, and then get reimbursed. We'll, and then install. Okay, so that yeah. So we purchase them, and if we wanted to, we could literally sit them in the east wing of Hartley Dodge, and they would still reimburse us. No. I, I haven't to, read I just, the 300 pages of the <laughs> grant. Yeah, I would just want to verify that, but I, but that's part of the reason for having the ordinances to just get get us out of the blocks and get us moving on this. Um, I think it's a great thing. I'm just it would have to be operational. I would guess. Yep. It's like we have to finish <laughs> the road before they pay us, right? They don't well, pay most us most so, most likely that we're going to do it. But I don't know what the timelines are. I haven't so we'll, looked at we'll, the we'll paperwork yet. Okay. Yep. Maureen. So to to put in these charging stations, we're we're losing parking spaces. Yes. Yes, but not the not ten. Uh, the idea originally was to dedicate one at the charging station to electric vehicle only, and then perhaps to do some kind of a um, hybrid system for the other mm -hmm. spot, like maybe fifteen minute or thirty minute parking in that spot. Okay, because that's my second question: is how how long would someone be? parked and charging at one of these units. I know it's, you know, depending on how, where your battery is, but is there like a... Maureen, if you get closer to your microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. Is, it, is there some, like, mean or... Do we know... Are we going to have... If, some, if I'm going to bring my, my um, Tesla and have it park for eight hours charging? No. I, I don't think... I think it's like two hour max. Okay. 
and that's why they're in parking lots. They're not in street spaces. Um, you know, and they're in parking lots typically where people tend to spend a little bit more time mm -hmm. uh, in all these lots. What, what, you, what would you be doing when your car is at Cook Avenue parking lot charging? You'd be shopping. Yeah, there, there you go. go. <laughs> Hopefully. Yep. Eating. Yep. Any other questions? I was just saying, I think we just still need to have some level of time limit enforcement yeah. um, that those spots are not just, if you have an electric vehicle or a hybrid, that plug-in hybrid, you can park there indefinitely because we yeah. do want yeah. turnover. Um, and I don't know if we're expecting people to come there and, and fully charge their vehicle. Um, on the other hand, we may want to consider what we're doing for something like Cook Ave or some of these other lots for the people who live there and who maybe want to park overnight and charge at the same time, allowing them to do that. But as long as the car is cleared by a certain time in the morning. It'll have to be incorporated into the ordinance we just uh, passed, I imagine, in some way, some amendment to that to address yeah. this. But I, I, certainly that, that would all be important because the six charging stations would not be worth it if people are to take one car takes it all day long. No. Well, actually, it kind of the purpose. Sorry? I answered my own question in my head, which was we have a 90-minute parking limit downtown, so... Yep. An hour and a half is all you get to charge your car. Yep. Two hours. Okay, so that's, uh, we have that ordinance um, 48 for introduction. Thank you. Okay. Great news. Police firearms training facility. <laughs> Lieutenant Longo. Oh, good. I didn't know you were here. I was, I was all ready to present this. You, thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me. I'll just start off. That, that's the quietest Joe has ever been. Yeah. I know. That's my bedtime, so it's going to be quiet in three minutes. Um, Tom, to continue on the green theme, I just love the plastic ban idea. I have to say this. The two police cars that are on the resolution tonight are our first hybrid police cars. Or, yeah. So there'll be more. There'll be more um, to come. But Ford says uh, we should be saving an average of like three thousand dollars per patrol car in gasoline a year. So um, it's a big green theme tonight. But I'm going to talk very briefly or quickly about the police training facility. Just arrow down, Joe. The uh, space bar. Ah. All right, the, uh, our, our original building, which is down in the DPW yard, was uh, built in the 1950s. It was originally built as a dog and cat shelter by Geraldine R. Dodge in the 60s, uh, late 60s, early 70s. It became the police firearms range. Um, the building had a classroom, a bathroom, a kitchen, and storage facility for ammo. It was demolished in 2017, late 2017, to make way for the, the new electric utility building which was moved to a different location. Um, this is the design of the new building. We went back and forth between uh, Bob Vogel, Frank Russo, the chief of police, Kevin Boone, who's our firearms instructor. Um, you will notice a garage, and I'll get into that. Um, the proposed range house is going to be right there. I added some nice trees in the design as well. <laughs> you really can't tell where this is. Uh, however, if you know where the shooting range is, the electric utility building where the um, lineman park is roughly here. And um, that's right along the fence line. The, one of the reasons why we did that is because that garage um, storage area uh, has trailers in it. One being will be a cone trailer and um, or message board trailers, which during the winter months will be stored, not left out to rust. and then we'll have to kick the jacks and whatnot because they don't work. So we'll be able to store a lot of our um, different trailers inside. Uh, one thing, because we are building the new building, um, we look to expand use. The one thing we wanted to do is just be better partners with the other departments um, and, and share because if the fire department could utilize it for training, so be it. Um, if we had to have some organization in town that needed to use it, that's great. So the more use for it, other than just uh, the police training, uh, we welcome that. Um, the fire chief, you know, utilizes, has drills down there, so he would be using it. We've also, um, in our meetings, uh, we've discussed utilizing it as a 
shelter during OEM emergencies as we've used the Ambulance Corps building in the past. That really didn't work out because it wasn't handicapped accessible, handicap accessible, where this would be whenever you build a new building, apparently you have to be handicap accessible. So this would make for a much better OEM shelter if we had to. Um, another, again, point, point up on the slide behind me is that it's also, uh, when we had to bring in like Hurricane Sandy, I read, we brought in other linemen. We couldn't get them into hotels right away instead of them sleeping in the hallway of public safety building, which we set up cots and whatnot in public safety, this could be an area where they could sleep um, because in typical situations where it's a storm emergency, you really can't get hotel rooms at the ready. It takes a few days, so instead of alignment sleeping in public safety, this would have an adequate area and they'd be closer to the electric utility plant. Quick, uh, while you switch it, Robert, are you picking up, uh, Joe? Okay. I'm sorry, Mayor. It, yeah. No, it sounds like you're speaking loud enough. So you're... All right, I'll try to get closer. Again, I went over the large garage area. It's just uh, storage of our assets instead of being left out in the snow. Uh, cone trailer, um, message boards. The uh, garage area will also be utilized by the fire department to, for training purposes. Um, so you can enhance security. We'll have cameras, the police network, which will allow us to put cameras that are live monitored by the police, public safety, by the dispatcher of public safety. Um, so if anyone wants to stroll down the yard and do any illegal dumping, we'll be there watching, or at least if we miss it, we could go back and look at it quickly. Um, that's the interior plan. Again, it's um, nothing finalized, but that's a rough uh, a plan. You're going to see it. There's not two showers. The second thing is a mop floor drain, which by code you're required to have. That was news to me. So. Some various exterior shots of the building. Um, total cost for the proposed firing range is uh, $270,000. There was two previous appropriations. One of the things, uh, some of the additional, the already budgeted money went to DEP permitting and whatnot. So, and that would that that permitting was um, for the entire development of the yard, the recycling center, the electric utility. So, uh, the money that was early, uh, early appropriated um, earlier was used to um, offset some of those costs. I hope I kept it to three minutes, <laughs> but I'm here to answer any questions. So the. Um since we initially appro approved 140 or 130,000, we need another 140. What was the change in plans that uh, created that? Um, that's correct, Mayor. It, initially, we were looking to do something that wasn't um, as uh, I wouldn't say we were we added masonry to ensure the longevity of the building and did other uh, things that when we build this building um, you, you're not going to have we're not going to have to come back to the mayor and council whether it be everyone here or someone else hey we need to do this um, again so by building the building and spending the extra money um, I think you're going to get a you know 50 or 60 year building um, rather than our initial plan, which would probably be 10 or 20 years. I gotta be honest with you, I'm a police officer. I'm getting this all from Russ Brown. He, he's the master <laughs> with everything, and, mm -hmm. it, you know. So that, that's, that was the initial, you know, um, thought process on this. Uh, or CFO. The, the estimates that we had were preliminary. As Joe said, we used certain, a portion of the funds. That ordinance is showing available funds, not all the funds that were appropriated. We had to go through a DEP permitting process. Um, so we used funds for that, which was important. And um, now that we're able to have refined numbers and know exactly what we're doing, um, we need to come in with an additional funding ordinance. Nothing opulent in there, no kitchens, no, no nothing fancy, just a, a meeting room, um, an armory, and then the addition of the garage, which we thought was important to maintain borough assets. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then I think, Jim, the other thing was one of the changes tonight was the original police car ordinance. One of the vehicles was coming out of the cap, I'm sorry, the operation fund, and one was coming out of the trust fund, and now they're both coming out of the trust fund? No, they're one, one operating, one trust Yeah, it's still... Really? Okay, yeah. that's not the way I read the, ordinance, the, the, the thing. Okay. Yeah. Maureen? Um, you mentioned DEP. 
um, lead is very much in the news these days. Do we have to, I mean, what do we do with spent cases and all that other stuff? I mean, how do Regarding, so we did have a firm come in and examine our area, and, and also the New Jersey Attorney General came in, a part of our accreditation process in the police department. We went through the accreditation process three years ago um, to ensure our, our firearms range was safe and also our policies, procedures, training records, where everything were up to date. So on top of the accreditation standards, we also got a thorough review, and I credit Ken Shannon. He, did, he reached out to the gentleman who does that for the Attorney General's office, oh. mm -hmm. and they came up to ensure that everything is safe and uh, okay. whatnot. Other questions or comments? No, I see. Never mind. And no. Joe, didn't no. we didn't we pick we pick up the casings afterwards? We That's spend, correct. Yeah, we spend yep. time after the whole training session going on picking yeah, up. Yeah, going up and yep. cleaning the site up. Yeah, snow shovels. Believe it or not, the end. Snow okay. shovels pick it up the best. <laughs> Talking to Joe. All right. Any other questions? So we'll come back with ordinance to a, a consensus as to move forward. Uh, ordinance to appropriate. All right. Thank you for staying so late. I've never felt safer. Yeah, Council you. meeting. Yeah, you guys do. At least Joe's close. All right, moving on to ordinances of hearing. Will the clerk please read the statement? Ordinance is scheduled for hearing. We're introduced by title and passed on first reading at the regular meeting of the council held Monday, September 9th, 2019. All were posted and filed according to law, and copies were made available to the general public requesting the same. I call up ordinances for second reading and ask the clerk to read said ordinance by title. Ordinance 44 2019, Ordinance of the Borough of Madison, amending Chapter 185 of the Borough Code entitled Vehicles and Traffic to Delete Valley Road as a Through Street. I open the hearing for Ordinance 44. Anyone wishing to comment on this, please step forward. Seeing none, I close the hearing. Mayor, I move Ordinance 44 2019. I second that motion. Council discussion? Roll call vote. Ms. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. I declare Ordinance 44-2019 adopted and finally passed and ask the clerk to publish notice thereof in the newspaper and file the ordinance in accordance with the law. Ordinance 45-2019. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $65,000 from the General Capital Improvement Fund for emergency storm sewer lining repair between Loveland Street and Anthony Drive. I open the hearing for Ordinance 45. Anyone wish to comment, please step forward. Seeing none, I close the hearing. Mayor, I move Ordinance 45-2019. Second. Any council discussion? Roll call vote. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. I declare Ordinance 45-2019 adopted and finally passed and ask the clerk to publish notice there in the newspaper and file the ordinance according to the law. Ordinance 46-2019. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $100,000 from the General Capital Improvement Fund for the Department of Public Works Recycling Center project. I open the hearing for Ordinance 46. Anyone wishing to comment, please step forward. Seeing none, I close the hearing. Mayor, I move Ordinance 46-2019. Second. Any council discussion? Roll call vote. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. I declare Ordinance 46-2019 adopted and finally passed and ask the clerk to publish notice thereof in the newspaper and file the ordinance in accordance with the law. And now we're on to our second for invi invitations for discussion. This is when you may comment on any topic and step up to the lectern, st state your name, your address. And write the same on the clipboard. Try to keep your comments to three minutes. But if uh, I will give you one minute grace and ask you to stop at four. Anyone wishing to comment on any topic, please step forward. Tom, welcome back. <laughs> I'm Harold Pudis. Sorry, I left for a minute. I had to pick up somebody from the MRC. Yep. Mm -hmm. Soccer player. Luckily, it's nice and close. And our police officer was here, so he couldn't catch me. <laughs> so one thing I wanted to bring up to everybody's attention, I know there's a emphasis now on making the streets even safer for driving. We talked about that, Mayor, when I passed you the other day. And um, one area I wanted the borough to consider, or a couple of areas, is the, the two elementary schools, Kings Road and Torrey J. 
the, uh, the drop-off areas around there, in my opinion, are, are kind of hazardous the way that they're lined up now. You, and Joe, I, I don't know if you were with me when I was with, with uh, Ripka, Officer Ripka, when he was on the force. Uh, he was in charge of the street safety, I think. But you might have been involved, too, when I was complaining how we changed the drop-off pattern over at Tory J when we made Glenwall a one-way from the west to the east. And now all of the parents, right around the corner of New Gym, of course, all the parents had a drop-off either on Green Village Road or Woodland Road. So you have 100 plus cars in the morning all trying to either stop to walk their kids up to the school or even just pull in and maneuver around traffic. On Green Village Road, when you open your door, you pull over to the side and you open your door, you're in the road. There's really not a lot of space between the curb and the street. And Woodland Road is almost as treacherous. Plus you have school bus coming up eventually and then 100 cars every few minutes passing you. So. I, I really think that presents an unsafe situation for drop-off and pickup, and and, I, and it was on when I was on the school board, the change was made, and I, I, Lisa probably remembers me being concerned about it. The same thing in Kings Road. When I leave a Rotary meeting at 8:30, Mayor, approximately, and I'm heading towards work down Kings Road, it's very dangerous there because there's a lot of people rushing on Kings Road, and there's a hundred cars trying to pull over. Some parents want to get out of their cars. At Kings Road, and I don't know if this is something you could consider, you have Lipsy Park, which is probably not used more than two days a year by any residents, in my opinion. We could probably use that part of it, if it's permissible, by open space or wherever you got your money, to make some kind of drop-off area in there also, because it's just a vacant park that's not really being used much. So something I wanted you guys to consider, and, and not to just you know, postpone until next year. I think it's very important, and we see what can happen, unfortunately, with the, the drivers that are on the road now, and whatever the reason is. If it's during leaf pickup, and the curbs are full of leaves, or snow time, or whatever, it does have a, it does create an unsafe situation for our residents. So it's just something I wanted to bring to your attention. Thank you. Uh, not everything else is great. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. Just a uh, follow-up. We. Um with our complete streets committee, a big part of it is talking about the uh, drop off and pick up at all, at all the schools. As we know, it is far different than uh, when the schools were built in these locations when we all walked to school and now it's uh, dropping off. And so it is an ongoing conversation. Uh, we have some conversations going on with the county as far as improvements on Green Village Road for a better pickup on uh, around Tory J. And uh, certainly Kings Road presents uh, challenges. Um, Central Avenue School is also another tip, but that's probably, of the three elementary, that's probably got the best setup, but uh, they all are, and it's a high priority to keep our children safe. So thank you for uh, bringing that up, and we will keep it on the front burner. Yes. Hi. Um, I have a little handout, so I, uh, it's the um, microplastics report from the Great uh, Swamp. And we have Sandra Levine, who's the director of water quality, and she's going to talk so, to that. But so I Claire, so start with your na name. My name is Claire Whitcomb. I'm chair of the Environmental Commission. I live on 12 Fairwood Road. Is that it? is that what yes. I'm supposed to say? Yeah, <laughs> I did. And uh, the clerk will take those. Uh, actually, if you can oh, hold, make, make your comments, and you can bring it up when. Um, okay. Yeah. Mayor, she wants. Can we, yeah. we each have a copy of what she's handing out? You might yeah. Want to read it yeah. Well, it should be given. It needs to be given to the clerk to be. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Well, I also want to point out that Sandra's been to the Chatham Township uh, meetings multiple times, and that that I'm going to restate that this is uh, a partnership with uh, Madison Chatham Township and Chatham Borough, and our ordinances are, as far as I know, identical or at least mildly tweaked. Um, Chatham um, Borough is introducing tonight. Chatham Township is introducing on the 26th, on Thursday. We've been working on this. Maureen's been in our meetings. Um, it, it, and there's a lot of towns in front of us. There's a lot of towns behind us. Jessica sent out an email. There's 11 towns that are saying, tell us how it went. 
ask, tell us what everyone's questions were. We need to know how to troubleshoot this for our towns. It's really uh, not kind of an isolated event. It's really a wave. I mean, Parsippany's passed it. Paramus, the hotbed of um, commerce, is passed it. And if they can do it, Maplewood, South Orange, Milburn's just about to pass it. Uh, Berkeley Heights is doing it. Mars Township, I think. Um, Harding is interested. So um, there will be a shift. We're going to all have to challenge ourselves to find sustainable solutions because it's not going to be as easy to live without plastic bags as it was. And so what um, the three towns are talking about is forming an education task force that would kick in the minute we know this is going to pass. Jessica has already reached out to ShopRite. We feel like we need to provide merchants with you know, education about the sustainable options that are going to replace the DDC bags and the other things of that nature. Um, you know, we're going to have to dig into it. For the farmers market and summit gave up plastic bags altogether. They get, they handed out um, usable bags for like three weeks, and then everybody was on their own, and, and the adjustment was just over. So, um, I'm going to also just uh, remind everybody that the people who are really, really, really uh, in favor of this are the kids, and this really bubbled out from the Green Vision Forum and the kids who presented multiple schools on how they're concerned about microplastics in the water, they're concerned about um, all these plastic bags ending up in animals in the ocean, and it, it, we're part of um, the ecosystem that's contributing these. So I think that's enough. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Sandra Levine. I'm from Great Swamp Watershed Association. My home address is 1798 uh, Route 57 in Atkinson. Um, uh, I, I am the Director of Water Quality Programs for the Great Swamp Watershed Association, and in 2018 we began a pilot study to assess the amount of microplastics in the surface waters in our local streams. Um, we constantly hear about microplastics in the ocean um, and how big a problem it is in the environment, but they don't just magically appear in the ocean, and so we wanted to know what was going on in our small upstream areas. Um, unfortunately, what we found was um, more than we thought we would. Um, we used a site upstream um, on the Passaic River, uh, just above, uh, just below Route 202, and um, as our site for our control, thinking that that would really give us an idea of that would be one of our cleanest sites, and unfortunately that was the site where we found the most plastics within the Great Swamp Watershed. Um, and the majority of the plastics that we found in our samples were what we call film plastics. Film plastics get into our streams from the breakdown of these bags that you guys are hopefully going to um, promote this ordinance for to prevent um, being given out anymore. So it is really an important issue. Um, microplastics in general are not just an environmental issue, they are a health issue. Um, again, reports are showing that the microplastics in our streams are moving up the food chain um, from the small organisms that uptake them through the fish and onto people's plates when you're eating that fish. So it's not just an issue of we need to just protect the environment and we need to slow down. We need to think about human health issues and the long-term effects of these plastics and what kind of health effects they might have on people um, down the road. So uh, Great Swamp Watershed Association strongly supports um, these communities, all of your communities coming together uh, to work on these ordinances. Uh, and if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer okay. them. Yeah, it's just it's a one-way conversation. So, <laughs> but it, it's a very important one-way conversation. We'll, we'll be the the council as we introduce the uh, ordinance. Will be uh, have an opportunity to make their comments at that point. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Seeing none, I close this part of the meeting and we move on to um, introduction of ordinances. Will the clerk please read the statement? Ordinance is scheduled for first reading. Have a hearing date set for Wednesday, October sixteenth. All will be published in the Madison Eagle, posted on the bulletin board, and made available to members of the public requesting copies. 
I call up for ordinances for first reading and ask the borough clerk to read said ordinances by title. Ordinance 47-2019. Ordinance of the borough of Madison prohibiting the use of plastic bags and regulating the use of paper bags by retail establishments within the borough of Madison. Mayor, I move ordinance 47-2019. Second. All right, let me, I'll start with the comments and then ask the, um, obviously, the council to add any other comments. Um, first of all, uh, update on the scorecard. I did get a uh, text message from Mayor Bruce Harris in uh, Chatham Borough, and they have, um, they introduced, and it was, uh, ordinance as stood, uh, was passed um, in, by the uh, Chatham Borough Council on a 6-0 vote. Um, You've heard the comments already about the importance of this ordinance. Um, we had ANJAC here, the Association of New Jersey Environmental Commissions, uh, back in the spring, making a presentation. Many towns were represented. Um, at that point, most of the municipalities that had passed an ordinance were shore communities where it really was showing up on the beach and so on. As, as I pointed out that night, they were uh, not not only kind of like an island on their own introducing ordinance, they, some of them were literally just an island. But um, it, since then, many communities have ad addressed it. Uh, as I said that night, it, I think this is something that is very important to do as a, uh, as a region. Um, I even said that if we were going to go it alone, I would probably hold off because it would be too confusing for many of our residents who would shop one day and uh, stop and shop and the next next week in uh, ShopRite or uh, Kings and Chatham and have different rules. And so it is very impressive in this home rule capital of the world that we have uh, communities working together to uh, put this ordinance out there. Um, we, we heard that uh, in some of the comments in one of the uh, communities about, you know, why don't you just do education? I think the uh, Madison Eagle editorial said it very um, succinctly is um, education with seatbelts only took us so far. Very few, you know, people understood seatbelts were important, but people didn't really start doing it until they would get that ticket for not clicking. So I, I think, yeah, and we've also approached the education uh, with a resolution last spring during the uh, plastic, uh, stay away from plastic month is the idea of having stores ask before they bagged. I was recently at a store when I uh, told the clerk, you should really ask before you bag it. And, they, and she said, well, I tried that, but I got yelled at. So uh, it's, it's kind of not working. And we need to make a difference in our local level. I don't know what the total number of bags in the uh, four communities that, uh, actually more than four, the two Chathams, uh, well, four right now that are committed, uh, two Chathams, Madison, Morris Township, and hopefully Harding, but the number of bags that we can take out of circulation by taking a step it will be impactful. And um, we also anticipate that the state will have no choice but to adopt a statewide or, uh, law once they see, well, it's very easy because most of the towns have stepped forward. There, there have been some comments, uh, the DDC reviewed this and there was concerns around um, the uh, various uses of plastic bags. I uh, have a commitment from uh, Claire Whit Whitcomb as with the Environmental Commission working with some of these uh, stores as far as, um, for example, when they're, they're doing shirts for te multiple teams, how to package the shirts to get them out. The other is related to the 10 cent uh, charge for bags. Um, there was a concern about should we do that or not. Step one is getting rid of the plastic bags. That, as you heard from uh, Great Swamp Watershed, how important getting plastic out of the stream is. So it, we, we need to do that now. But changing habits to a non-disposable world is what we're really trying to do. And 10 cents, yes, some people might see it as a nuisance, but it'll be a, a reminder that um, you know, I will bring my bag, and we, we need to make sure we change that. I, um, I have walked out of stores with an armful of things where I forgot the bag, but I'm not uh, going to use that single use. And just for the record, because someone pointed out that they saw me with a single use bag today, it was the second use. I was carrying a bag of mail <laughs> to the post office. So it was, it had, I did not get it today. So just to be clear, but those are the things, and it is very important. Um, 
I think that we have an ordinance that is consistent with the other towns and so we are together and it will spread across. Uh, if there are issues, I have some thoughts on how to get through the issues, but I, I think the ordinance as it stands right now is what needs to be done and hopefully will be introduced to tonight. Uh, some of the things that Tom uh, mentioned, um, uh, Peapod, which is part of Stop and Shop, they, they, they do the pack bagging right there at Stop and Shop, I believe, but we will make sure that this, uh, we'll have the attorney review that to make sure that home delivery is, doesn't, is not a uh, fall through the cracks, to be honest. My wife and I used Peapod once when it all came in the plastic bags because I thought it was going to come in bins. I said, forget this. Um, take out food. I know some restaurants have already shifted away from uh, plastic for the takeout food. And uh, things like Bottle Hill Day, you know, we, we will work through education and through a process. So, other comment? Deb? A um, couple of comments. I, I'm all for it. I support it 100%. But with the education piece, are we doing education outside of the businesses and letting the public know ahead of time that this is... I know we've done some. There's been great things at the farmer's market and that sort of thing. But I'm just thinking we need to continue to make sure people are aware. I know personally I finally am in the habit where I can go in the store with the bags and not have to go back to my car. Um, the things like the 10 cent charge, which is fine, but my question is, is things like, I do self-checkout at Stop and Shop all the time. So how is that 10 cents charge, like if I go through a cashier, they're going to put it on there, but if I'm doing self-checkout and I'm using their paper bags. The, the auditor will get you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that just a, just a question on the enforcement front, and then I'd be remiss if I did mention we did talk about this at Board of Health, because in here the health officer or his designee um, is set to be the kind of enforcer, um, and they were very much in support of that for the food establishments and places they inspect as a general rule and events, but the concern was if they don't normally go into tons of toys or Cambridge Street papers or the Pink Pear or whomever, how, would, how is that piece going to work? And I think it's just something that needs to be a discussion. I don't think it's a, a limitation, but there was some concern yep. on that front. So a, a couple of quick things on, um, on the um, self-checkout and all that. I, th I think one of the things which has already been mentioned is stop and shop. It's, it's sadly, you know, Stop and Shop is ready to fl flip the switch as soon as they're told they have to do it. They, they, they know they have to do it for the entire state of right. Connecticut, and I don't know how many stores they have there. So I, I think they probably will they'll have the auditors watching you trying to steal that bag. So, um, I think that'll be addressed. The, the education part, I, we, with our uh, great work of the Environmental Commission, I think we, we will be rolling that out, not just to the stores, but all the residents. and. I've been mentioned a couple of times, I think part of this, and we heard that this is very important to the children of the community, that many children starting decades ago got their parents to quit smoking cigarettes because they came home and say, mom, dad, why are you doing that? Many, many of our children will be saying the same thing about mom, dad, why, why are you not going in with your bags? So but it'll be a, a complete across the board education program. Maureen? No, I mean, and this is not, this is not the finished work. This is the first step going forward. And I think it's really remarkable um, what we're trying to accomplish. I mean, just in the last few months, um, being, being around the Environmental Commission, um, I've seen my plastic bag usage go way down. Um, and, you know, as, you, as they said about Summit, you know, you give out bags for three weeks, and at the end of that, it's like, Oh well, so um, yeah, I think it's a I think it's a wonderful thing that we're doing. And, and just going back to the enforcement, one of the things tweaks we did with our ordinance is it says health officer or designee. So we, we know with through food, food establishments, even Walgreens is covered. Right. So we get probably 80, 90 percent of the bag production, but we can use a designee for more appropriate for the uh, you know Cambridge Papers of the world and others. Any other comments, Pat? A um, couple quick questions. Um, just looking at the ordinance 136A 2, use prohibited effective date number B, uh, letter B. It says effective date March 1st, 2020. Single use plastic carryout bags may not be distributed on township property or township sponsored events. So, and first we need to correct it to borough, sure but, but, but more importantly, the question is, if it's town borough property or borough sponsored events, I'm assuming that covers Bottle Hill Day. 
because it gotcha. takes place on our property and it's a borough sponsored event. So yes. anything like that, I'm assuming this is going to apply to. Um, in terms of the restaurants, so what was the thinking behind not having them comply also in terms of takeout food? The, uh, but part of it, th th this is the uh, is based on the model ordinance that Anjack put together. Um, I don't know if, if Claire, if you're able to answer that question, why? Uh, we well, have to ste step up to. Again, uh, Claire is being invited up. Not so she spoke before as a resident. She is the chair of the Environmental Commission. So, uh, Pat, all I, all I know is it's pretty standard in these ordinances. I think there's an issue with like leakage and takeout food. So. Uh, their plastic bags aren't that good, but okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I mean, you, it, it's just, you know, things that are food centered are typically have a carve out, and that's one of them. That's that's the best answer I could get. Okay. okay, does that work? And then the last question is kind of odd, but under one thirty six a dash four. Uh, letter F. It says nothing in this ordinance shall prohibit a retail establishment from offering for sale reusable bags, including those made of club blah, blah blah that are specifically designed to manufacture for multiple reuse for a fee of ten cents. It just seems like an odd thing to put in here. I mean, it, it sounds like you might want to encourage people to reuse bags, but I'm not sure why you would put that in an ordinance. Yeah, I, I, um, and it's just that n nothing would prohibit, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, um, again, the standard language, I guess that's what it's been working okay. with. Thank you. And one, one last point. Um, Single-use plastic bags are a rather recent phenomenon. I mean, I, I'm, I would think only in the last 30 years. So, I mean, if we managed for all those years without single-use plastic bags, I'm thinking... We can probably make the adjustments and uh, for the health and well-being of our children and switch to reusables. Thank you. <coughs> Any discussion? Roll call vote. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Yes. All right, Ordinance 48-2019. appropriating $30,000 from the General Capital Improvement Fund for electric vehicle charging stations. Mayor, I move Ordinance 48-2019. Second. Any further discussion? Roll call vote. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Yes. Mr. Yes. Yes. Ordinance 49-2019, which was uh, posted, has been uh, pulled. And that number will be retired. Um, will the clerk please read the statement on consent agenda resolutions? Consent agenda resolutions will be enacted with a single motion. Any resolution requiring expenditure is su supported by a certification of availability of funds. Any resolution requiring discussion will be removed from the consent agenda. All resolutions will be reflected in full in the minutes. Mayor, I move resolution. Um, 267 through um, R284. Second. Any discussion or any that need to be pulled? Roll call vote. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. Mr. Byrne? Yes. yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Yes. All right. There is no unfinished business. Approval of vouchers. Will the clerk please read the voucher registry? For the current fund, $3,941,743.43. General Capital Fund, $53,599.51. Electric Operating Fund, $686,300.09. Electric Capital Fund, $55,529.27. The Water Operating Fund, $2,225.48. And the Trust, $42,242.38. The total is four million seven hundred eighty-one thousand six hundred forty dollars and sixteen cents. Mayor, I move approval of the vouchers. Second. Any discussion? Roll call vote. Ms. Bailey. Yes. Mr. Rowe. Yes. Ms. Byrne. Yes. Mr. Hoover. Yes. Ms. Cohn. Yes. Okay. All right. Under new business, I would like to uh, make the following appointment: requesting council confirmation for the Parks Advisory Committee, David Miller, 50. Dean Street for unexpired one-year term through December 31st, 
Mayor, I move um, approval of David Miller for the Parks Advisory Committee. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Mayor, I move that we adjourn the meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you all. So 9 p.m., Deb? <laughs> nope. Don, you were eloquent as always, but you made the meeting go way too long. I know. I can't believe that. I'm like, the, I got, you, bro you broke your. Uh, I feel really bad. I texted Matt. I texted Matt. I'm still here. It must be your fault. I think it's further from the truth. I'm not killing you. I didn't say you were killing you. I didn't say you were killing you. You said we're going to have to raise taxes.